This evening, we're going to begin our examination of that summary of the core of Orthodox doctrine, Orthodox faith, that is found in the Nicene Creed. And, of course, our use of the Nicene Creed as a source of the tradition of the church's faith is going to be the same as the way we use any other source of the church's faith, whether it be the scripture or the liturgy or the others that we've, we've spoken of in the past two weeks. And that is that although everything that is said is professed, in this summary of, of our faith is, of course, true, and the profession, the personal profession of everything that that creed says is essential to every member of the Orthodox Church. We would never say that, that the Nicene Creed says it all, you know, says all that, that uh, can be said. Rather, we use it as, as a, a, useful, a useful tool, a summary of, of doctrine that has withstood uh, the test of time. So before we, we look at uh, the first phrase of the Nicene Creed, and that's going to be uh, the subject of, of uh, most of the talk this evening, those first five words, uh, I believe in one God, I want you to have uh, at least a general understanding, a good, uh, a good mental picture of how the Nicene Creed uh, came to be. In the fourth century, a council of the bishops of the church was held in, in the city of Nicaea. That's where the Nicene comes from. Uh, Nicaea then uh, was a suburb of of Constantine, Emperor Constantine's newly built uh, capital. He built a new capital for the Roman Empire, the city of Constantinople. He moved from old Rome to Constantinople. And in the, in the suburbs of Constantinople was the city of Nicaea. Of course, it's still there today, but now uh, Constantinople has turned into Istanbul, and it's a Turkish city, no longer the, the uh, capital of the Greco-Roman world. But a council of bishops met in the city of Nicaea in the year 325. And that council was summoned by the emperor Constantine himself. Constantine was the, was the emperor who put an end to the three centuries of intermittent persecution that had gone on uh, in, uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the way the law was, was expressed was, uh, f until Constantine was that Christians simply could not exist. Christianity was not legal. Uh, it was not a recognized religion in the Roman world, and you have to bear in mind that the Roman world of, of the time of Christ and the apostles and up until the fourth century and, and for a while thereafter included everything from, from Spain in the west to, to Armenia beyond Syria in the east and North Africa, the whole, the whole Mediterranean world there. The reason why the Roman Empire uh, made the Christian church illegal was that the Christians refused to do what was considered essential to being a good, uh, either 
uh, citizen or inhabitant of the Roman Empire, and that is the Christians absolutely refused to refer to the Roman emperor as a god. Uh, if they had done so, uh, the, Roman, the Roman Empire would have extended to them great toleration because in the Roman society, uh, the more gods, the merrier. You know, in fact, there were, even, there were even some of the Roman emperors who liked to import uh, as many new gods as they can find. You know, first the gods from Greece, then the gods from Egypt and from the Middle East. Uh, the Jewish god, the Christian god, you know, they would have even been happy to make a nice statue as they would have imagined him to be and add him to their collection of gods. But uh, the Christians would not have that, of course. Uh, and that, that's going to lead us up to what we're going to say about I believe in one God. And so intermittently throughout those first three centuries, uh, there, there was the great period of persecution by the Roman state. did not go on constantly. It depended on how much the emperor or the government wanted to enforce the edicts against the Christians. But Constantine was the one who, who uh, officially put an end to it. And, of course, he was the first emperor on his deathbed to be baptized under rather suspicious conditions, but we won't talk about that right now. But nevertheless, uh, he, he extended toleration, uh, protection, and, and later on even uh, patronization of the church. And one of the things he did was that he summoned the bishops in the year 325 at his expense, at government expense, to come to the capital and to have a council. Why did he want them to have a council? Well, because there was trouble, uh, as there you know, uh, always seems to be in one form or other in the church. Uh, the Christians, many of them, uh, were not sure about what was taught, what was to be believed in the church concerning who Jesus Christ is. There were those who had arisen in the church who were teaching new and false doctrines, things that did not uh, fall into the necessary criteria of that which has been believed by everyone, everywhere, uh, from the beginning. And because in many cases, uh, the, the Christian population was growing and growing in, in the Roman Empire, was becoming a majority thing, especially with the end of the persecution. And because uh, the population, even though uh, they were Christians, especially in the cities, tended to be a kind of little wild and unruly, you know, uh, Constantine, the emperor, being a good Roman general, wanted law and order in his empire. So uh, he summoned the bishops uh, and said, now you have to uh, you have to put an end to all of these, all of these riots and, and disputes and turmoils that are going on over, over the teaching of the church. So I brought, brought you here to make, to make a statement as to what the church really teaches. And, and you, you have to try to envision this. It was uh, how, how amazing a thing it must have been because uh, many of these bishops who came to this first council in Nicaea had lived through the last most vicious persecution under the Emperor Diocletian. You know, some came without one eye, some came without one leg, without one hand, had been maimed in, in the prisons uh, d during the persecution, and now they are the emperor's guests. See, the guests of the Roman emperor in his new capital. It must have been a, 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 an incomprehensible uh, thing for them to get used to. Uh, so, sort of like in our own time, what we see even in the last year, the, the crumbling of the Marxist re regime in, in what was the Soviet Union and the, the toleration of the church there after only about 70 years of persecution. But here in the Roman state, the church had been persecuted even from the beginning. So here they are, the bishops, and, and there after, after spending some time uh, in attempting, what they were attempting to do was, of course, not say anything new, but to state what the church had professed from the beginning with increased clarity, with, with words that were adequate, that did not exhaust what the teaching was, but that were adequate to express it. And that statement of, of the church's faith uh, that comes from that council we call the, the Nicene Creed. And it uh, actually, it's the product of, of two councils. In, in most of it comes from the first council, and then even the first council, you see, didn't solve all the problems. And so there had to be a, a second council, 381, uh, first council of 
Constantinople. And that presented uh, the creed in its final form. So sometimes the Nicene Creed is called uh, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But it has been the standard of orthodox, correct uh, faith from that time. Someone who enters into the communion of the church, whether at baptism uh, or or, uh, for example, a, a uh, non-Orthodox Christian who has received baptism in the name of the Holy Trinity, as most of those who are inquirers uh, here tonight are, those seeking co full communion with the Orthodox Church, uh, they must profess in the presence of, of the whole Church before they are received into the communion of the Church, uh, the Nicene Creed. So it's appropriate that we use that as, as our standard and, and summary of, of the church's uh, most basic doctrines uh, in, in, our, in our classes now. The first phrase of the creed, of course the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means to believe. And as we look at the creed, we're going to have to examine it not simply phrase by phrase, but even uh, at times word by word. And that's what we're going to do tonight. First, we're going to talk about I. Then we're going to talk about believe. Then we're going to talk about in one God. Now, it might seem to some that these opening words of, of the creed kind of are something that we, we assume so easily. One might think, well, what, is there so much to say about these opening words, I believe in one God? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. First of all, if for those who are familiar with, with the way we speak in the prayers of the church, uh, whether it's in that most basic of Christian prayers, uh, the Lord's Prayer, or all the prayers of the liturgy, you will realize right away that, that usually we do not speak in the first person singular. Usually we do not use the I. The, the prayer that, that the Lord gave his disciples is in the plural, our Father, who art in heaven. When we come to church and, and uh, pray the prayers of the liturgy, it's always uh, we praise, we bless, we worship, we adore, we give thanks. And only in, in, uh, on, on two occasions in the creed and also in the prayer that, that the people in the church say right before Holy Communion, the prayer that begins with the words, I believe, O Lord, and I confess. And that prayer can be seen as a kind of uh, extension of the creed applying to the Eucharist. Only then do we, do we pray in the first person singular. And why is that? It's important. Because that personal profession of faith and, and the creed, for example, when someone enters into the church uh, is not simply recited. It must be professed as a personal confession of the faith that comes from the inmost depths of each person's being, that I, that, that is the expression of the heart. I believe, when I, when I can say, together with all those in the church, I believe what the church teaches, see, that is what you could say, what you could describe as the entrance ticket to become part of the body that expresses itself through the we. Once you can say, I believe, then you become part of those who can say, our Father. The I is the entrance into the we. And every time we profess the creed, uh, not simply when, when each person does so, when he enters the church or at a baptism, but every time we profess the creed at the Sunday liturgy, for example, that is a renewal, that profession of faith, of the 
essential condition of anyone not only entering but remaining in the communion of, of the Church of Christ, and that is the, the profession that comes from the personal, personal statement of faith that comes from the very depths of the being. So we, sh we need to look at, at the I as something that, not, that does not uh, keep me in isolation. We say, I believe, so that we can become part of those who, who say, uh, we praise, we bless, we give thanks, our Father. Secondly, we need to look at uh, the word believe, to have faith, because, of course, faith is, is everything depends on whether or not we have faith. The scripture gives a basic definition of what faith is. Probably many of you are familiar with this verse in the epistle to the Hebrews the 11th chapter, first verse. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. So on the one hand, faith is to be understood as an evidence, but on the other hand, it's not the kind of, it's not the kind of evidence that, that one has in this world, the evidence that is convinced by the senses or data or, or uh, collections of scientifically verifiable facts. It is another kind of evidence. We would say in the church a deeper evidence, the evidence of things not seen. Now, there are two levels of faith. two ways of understanding what it is to have faith, two ways of experiencing faith, we would say that both are essential. First of all, faith is the acknowledgement that something or someone exists. In the case of faith in God, which of course what we're talking about, the first kind of faith is the admission that there is a God. There is a, a being that is completely outside our sensual experience. The, the kind of thing uh, that would be uh, the, the opposite of what the verse from, from Hebrew says, the opposite of what is proved by the evidence of things that we do see. Now, many people, in fact, I would say the, the, probably the majority of, of the human population, arrive at this first sort of faith that God exists by something similar to what is described two verses later in that 11th chapter of, of the epistle to the Hebrews. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, we arrive at faith by making the basic decision that either everything that exists, everything that is, came into being as the result of a creative act by someone, a being, who is far beyond all, all the creation, or else everything that exists, exists by, by chance, as some sort of accident. That, in fact, that choice between, uh, between seeing the cosmos, uh, everything that exists, as the result of creation on the one hand, or, or seeing it as simply uh, the, result of, uh, the result of chance is one of those ultimate questions that we spoke of in the first session. And, and everyone that is encountering the teaching of the church 
always has to face those ultimate questions. And this is one of the first ones that, that whether or not we believe boils down to. Uh, does the world exist? Uh, do, does each one of us exist as a result of the creation of a god? Or does it exist be, uh, simply for, for no reason at all? There is no reason behind it. It's simply the result of blind chance. And you know, as in, in, in our world today, there are those, especially people who can make a lot of noise, who, who uh, would insist that the universe uh, exists only as a result of chance. But, but we, we could say that Probably the majority of, of the human race, if you ask them, if you took a survey of the whole world, and if you ask them, uh, do you believe that, uh, do you believe that everything that, that you see uh, was, came in, what came into existence exists because, because a god of some sort called it into being, probably most people still would answer in the affirmative, most people in this country, according to whatever, whatever uh, there is behind these, these uh, polls that they take, would probably say yes. So the first, the, the first level of faith is, is the acknowledgement that, that God exists, that the only explanation for the universe as we see it is that it is called into being by a supreme being. To deny it, we would say, would be something uh, not unlike saying that uh, this, this icon here uh, came into existence by all the color and form that comprise it, one day just assembling themselves together by chance. See, uh, we, th that, that would appear absurd to us, yet, yet the icon is, is something far less complex than, than not simply a human being, but even simply a, a cell of the human body. So it would be the, the, the tradition of the church to say that the wonder of creation demands, cries out for confession of faith in the Creator. But to say that God exists, simply that God exists, is, is only, only one level of faith. We must immediately go to the second level, which is that this God who exists is not some sort of vague supreme being or force or power, but is a personal God. A God who is a real person in fact, as we're going to say later on and, and spend a great deal of time on it, in fact, is three persons with whom we, as human persons, have an intimate relationship with. And furthermore, we would say that faith, if it is really faith, depends on uh, whether or not we not simply acknowledge that God exists, but also that our faith has brought us to the level of, of trust in this personal God. That the God who brought all things into being personally brought each one of us human persons into existence and desires that we share his life. And so we can trust him. We can rely on him. The entire scriptural revelation is based on, uh, its, it, its essential context is the response in faith of human beings to God. We, we've spoken, uh, uh, I think probably both the past weeks, of Abraham, that, that the history of, of God's revelation to, to human beings, choosing a people, begins with Abraham who responds to this call of God, who hears a voice one day. God's voice telling him to leave everything that he's known and go become a wanderer. You know, there's been lots of people in the history of, of the human race that have heard voices. Uh, Muhammad would say that he heard a voice. Uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of, of the Mormon church, would claim that he heard voice. Lots of people hear, hear voices, see. But the voice, the difference between the, voice, the, the voices that those others heard and the voice that Abraham hears is that 
Abraham really hears the voice of the one true and living God. And he responds. He does what that voice tells him to do. And it's the same thing for all, all of the great figures of the Old Testament, whether it's Moses or David or the prophets. They believe God. Likewise, in, in the New Testament, when Jesus begins his preaching of the gospel, he calls people to faith. He says, uh, the time is at hand, the kingdom of God is come, repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Jesus came to bring the good news. Almost everything of what we say when we, be, when we get to that part of the creed which speaks of what Jesus Christ did is, is considered good news, the best news that has ever come to this poor world. Jesus continually is calling people to believe in God the Father, and he also calls people to believe in him personally. In fact, as we're going to see in the gospel, Jesus says that people must believe in him if they are to have life, they must believe in him, the Son, in the same way as they believe in the Father. And so this faith involves both the acknowledgement of the, ex of the existence of the, of the God who is a personal God who summons us to have communion with him. Then we go on to say in the Creed that we believe in one God. That the God who begins his self-revelation to Abraham and to those who follow Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and, and the patriarchs, and Moses, and the people of Israel, and the, and the kings of Israel, and the prophets, who culminates that revelation of himself in Jesus Christ, his son, that the God who reveals himself in that way, in what we would call the Judeo-Christian revelation, is the one true and only God. And, and it's very important to realize, especially we, we it's a, become a kind of commonplace for us, we forget uh, that in, in the time of Israel, in the Old Testament, what an amazing thing it is for them to make such a claim. And, and nobody else, no other people make such a claim. You have this little, insignificant, relatively powerless people, uh, a, a group of, of nomads wandering from here and there, gradually uh, acquiring a kind of uh, cohesive existence, uh, dwarfed by all of the mighty empires that surround them through most of their history, making a claim that is unheard of, that their God is the only God. The, the other peoples had gods, but the other peoples would have said there's lots of gods, and sometimes if they thought very highly of ourselves, themselves, they would say their God is the best God. See, But Israel is the only one who says, like, like the 96th Psalm, the gods of all the nations are nothing, are nothing. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, is the only God. And this, of course, we have summed up, perhaps uh, most importantly, it's a, it's a passage of scripture with which everyone should be familiar from the fifth book of, of the Old Testament, the book of, of Deuteronomy, what I'm going to read to you from the sixth chapter uh, is, is really a, a summary of, of the entire faith of Israel in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. 
you know, the very strict observant Orthodox Jews to this day do all that literally. They wear these little, little boxes on their hands and on their forehead called phylacteries. And in those phylacteries, those little boxes, are the words written there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they, and they literally do write them on their doorposts and on their gates, even when they go through the door in, a, in an observant Jewish household. There's, a, there's a, little, a little thing on the door called the mezuzah, which contains the, 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 these words, which, which uh, a good Jew will kiss every time he goes in, goes into the house. And all of those external acts, See, the, uh, I, I like to point out those external acts of Israel because the, the faith that is revealed is always fleshed out materially, and we'll see how, how everything that we do in, in the Church of the New Covenant, we're always insistent also that, that our faith have visible expression, that it not be sim simply a collection of ideas or thoughts, but that it's really expressed through the body. But those, that, that claim that the, the Lord God of Israel is the only God is what sets Israel apart from all the peoples of the world, what makes the, the revelation that is given to Israel unique. And you either accept that claim or you reject it. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the areas of the world that, that the Christian faith has always had a very hard time really making much, much headway is, is uh, in India. Uh, where, where, where the system of the Indian religion, uh, of course, there are many religions that are born in India, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, but Hinduism really remains the way of life of, of the people of Israel, or of, of India. And the reason why uh, the, the Indian people have such a hard time uh, entering into the profession of Christian faith is that their whole way of looking at things is based on this, not that there is one God, that, that the, more, the more gods you multiply, the better, like I was saying with the Roman Empire earlier on. They're even happy, you know, they hear, you tell, you tell a Hindu, a good Hindu, about Jesus, and they'll say, oh, that's wonderful, you know, we'll add him to all the other ones we have. But that's not, see, that's not the, the claim of, of the Old Testament revelation. The claim is that the Lord our God is, is the only one all the gods of the nations are, are nothing. So, first of all, then, the, the profession that God is one, that the God of revelation is, as we said at the, be at the beginning of these sessions, not the product of human uh, imagination, that he reveals himself from, from outside the creation that he is, we're going to talk next week about, about creation, that, that the one God, the Father Almighty, is the creator of everything that is, that there is an immeasurable difference between the creator and the creature. Christian doctrine is rooted in that, that between even though the creature is called to have communion, the human creature is called to have communion with the creator, the difference between the creator and the creature is, is immeasurable. And we need to talk about now uh, what are called uh, in the church doctrine the attributes. of the one God, those aspects of his being, those, those things which describe who he is. Uh, the, the attributes of God include such things as, as uh, goodness, wisdom, uh, beauty, truth, I notice that, that I do not list uh, among the attributes what, what some people might, might say first, and that is love. The reason why we don't, we don't put it that way is, is uh, in, in the revelation that God has given of himself, he says of himself that, that he is love. So, so we, won't, we won't say that, that love is an attribute of God. Rather, we would say the God who, who is good, w goodness, wisdom, beauty, truth, uh, uh, eternal life, in all these things, he is, he is perfect love. Holiness. 
So all of these aspects of the divine, the divine being show us that God as he exists in his own self, in his own person, is completely beyond the creature. And what we have to do is focus on two of the attributes of God. If we, if we focus on those two, it will help us to understand all of them. And the first one is eternity. That what makes God, God, and before I start talking about what it means to be eternal, maybe this is a good place to, to insert this uh, warning that, that in the Orthodox life is very traditional to give, that our understanding is that even though we use all of these words to try to describe God, the most that we can ever have are, are there's an expression that, that uh, the fathers, the great teachers of the church like to use, that we have words that are adequate for God, but they are never words that, that exhaust God, because God is, is ultimately beyond all our words. In fact, in one of the, one of the prayers of the church that we say on, on the Feast of Pentecost, Pentecost comes 50 days after, after uh, the resurrection of the Lord. It's the day of the descent of the Holy Spirit, and on that day in the church we kneel down and we say special prayers. And one of them uh, begins with this expression. It's a, it's a good one to, to remember even though it doesn't often get translated like this. But what, what the prayer really says, it addresses God. It says, O oh God, who are beyond God. See, by saying that, it's saying that even, even when we try to call God, God, we have to remember that the word God is a production of, uh, of human language. See, and even when we say something like, God exists, yes, of course, God exists, but but we have to be careful that in saying that we're not already trying to impose on, on God who is immeasurably beyond us some kind of notion that we have about existence, that God's existence is far beyond anything that we can imagine existence to be. So we have to be content with, with words that are suitable, words that are adequate, but always be humble about the language we use and realize that, that none of our words can fully do justice and, and exhaust who God is. But we say that one of the most essential attributes of the divine being is that God is eternal. God always was. God always will be. God has no beginning. God has no end. And that means uh, for us, and it's, it's very important for, for our for our understanding and experience, our, our communion with God, that in God, therefore, there is no time. See, that uh, when we who are creatures who, are, who live in time, and we're going to talk later on about, about uh, time, the place of time in, in God's, God's uh, plan for things, when we speak to God, we are speaking to him who is outside. Time. When we use such a word as eternal, some people, you know, that when they have, when they think of eternal life, they, they think of that, that word eternal only in very human terms, as time that goes on and on and on. But that's not what eternal means. Eternal means no time at all. See, God lives in the eternal present. With God, there is no past. With God, there is no future. To have a past and a future, you have to have a beginning. God has no beginning, so there is no past or future for him. In fact, we would say the, uh, one of the most, one of the most uh, oh, specific things that differentiate us, the creature, from God is that for us, as we live in history, uh, just on the level of our, our life in this world, see, it's kind of the opposite of how God lives. For us, there is really no present. The moment we speak of the present, it's already in the past. See? 
even if it's a split second, it's already in the past. The present is something we can't quite get our hands on and grab and touch and hold. It's already in the past, already gone. That's, that's the difference between the creature who has the beginning and the creator who has no beginning. God, and that's why God, uh, when uh, we referred to before, when, when Moses asks God, what is your name, if you're going to send me back to, to this people uh, to, to bring them out of, out of uh, Egyptian slavery. And of course, Moses, if you read the account in the book of Exodus, had all kinds of doubts whether he, whether he, he could do that. He says, the people are going to ask, you, uh, ask me what your name is. Because up until that point, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was simply known as God or the Lord or the Mighty One. But he didn't have a personal name. So what Moses is asking God is to tell me what your personal name is. And, and that's, uh, that's when God gives Moses his name. I am who I am. Or the closest equivalent to how that, how that name of God was said in the Hebrew language is Yahweh. Notice it's in the present tense. See, I am who I am. I have no past, I have no future, I have no beginning, I have no end. God is eternal. That's why when we read in the Gospel, when, when Jesus speaks, uh, perhaps the most astonishing thing that, that Jesus says in the Gospel is when he is having one of his disputes uh, with the Pharisees who, who are arguing with him about, about his claims to be who he is. And, and finally, Jesus says to them, I assure you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. See, if we were, if, if we were speaking as human beings, uh, uh, to, uh, for example, if a parent were talking to his child, he would say, before you were, I was. But we would, but a uh, parent would never say to the child, before you were, I, I am. Only, oh, but Jesus says that. And, and the, the Jews knew exactly what he was saying because, but he not only said, I am, in saying, I am, he pronounced the holy name of God that nobody could pronounce in Israel out of reverence and applied it to himself. And so those who, do not, who did not believe in him, the gospel tells us, uh, took up stones to throw at him. If you, look, uh, if you look at the icon, every icon in the Church of Christ has these, these uh, Greek letters above, above the, the halo, the head of Christ, o on, and that, that comes from, from the Greek language, again, the existing one, I am. So, so in the iconography above the head of the Lord is, is the confession that that the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the one who has no beginning, no end. Now, the second attribute that it's so important for every Orthodox Christian and prospective Orthodox Christian or inquirer to understand the way the church has always understood it is that God reveals himself as the holy God. We need, we need to have a very clear understanding about what the word holy means. The word holy in the biblical Hebrew is kudush, but I want to, I want to use as the means of, of, of showing uh, from the origin of the word what, what holiness means to use the Greek the Greek word in whole, for holy is agios. Now, this center part of the word agios, or holy, this gi, means that which is earthly, that which is of this world, that which can be experienced by the senses. And, and of course, it's the same root that such English words as geological come from. You know, geology uh, is, is the study of, of the earth. And in the Greek language, if you use the prefix a and put it in front of something, it means not. It's a negative prefix. So 
the root meaning of the word holy, agios, from the Greek is not earthly, not of this world, not of human experience. Another way to put it is that the God who is holy, here is a kind of uh, rhyming word pair, is holy other. completely outside the experience of everything that is of this world. When God reveals himself to those to whom he chooses to do so in the Judeo-Christian revelation, it is always as the holy God. I want to read to you a few verses from the prophet Isaiah. This, these verses from the sixth chapter of the prophet Isaiah describes the call of Isaiah by God to be a prophet. And this is what Isaiah says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, Above it stood seraphim. We'll talk about seraphim in a week or two. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. It sounds very much like an Orthodox church. And then Isaiah said, I said, it's Isaiah that's speaking. See, he has this vision of God. And his response is this, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I who am Dios of, of this earth, I who am geological, have had this encounter with the one who is not of human experience, the Holy One, the unworldly one. And this response, you know, there are so many others throughout the Old Testament, whether it's when, when God appears to Moses in, in, the, in the bush that burns but isn't consumed, the first thing he is told is to, to uh, don't, don't approach casually. Take the shoes off your feet because the ground where you stand is holy ground because God is revealing himself to you. But I want to, uh, in order to illustrate this more, more precisely, I want to focus on two uh, encounters with the holy God that we have described in the New Testament with Jesus. When Peter, uh, before Peter has left everything to follow Jesus, has his encounter, one of his first encounters with, with the Lord. It's after he's been fishing all night. It's described in the fifth chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. And uh, he's fishing all night on the Sea of Galilee, and he doesn't catch anything. And uh, the Lord says to him in the morning, uh, the Lord has been preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he tells Peter, after, after he preaches to the crowd, he, tells, he gets into the boat and tells Peter to uh, let down the net again. And uh, Peter says, I've been working all night and caught nothing. Uh, and I imagine uh, you could even hear the kind of protest in his voice. Uh, but he says, at your word, I'll do it. I'll lower the net. And then the gospel tells us that the nets are filled with so many fish that they fill two boats and the boats start to sink. And uh, see, Peter's response is, is, is critical here because uh, he doesn't start uh, jumping up and down saying, yippee, you know. He, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Uh, he realizes that he is in the presence of the Holy One. And, and even that expression, depart from me, he's not saying, he's not saying get out of my life or anything like that. He, he's saying that uh, I... I am who I am, and you are who you are, and, and I, cannot, I, I cannot be 
I cannot be casual and presumptuous in, in, my, in, in the way uh, I, I encounter you. Here, here is something, here is someone totally beyond me. Now, this is at the, at the very beginning, but a perhaps uh, the last illustration that I want to give you is, is uh, perhaps the most important because it colors everything that you experience when you come, uh, when you come to Orthodox worship. Because the whole experience of the worship of the church, whether Old Testament or New Testament, is, is this reverence in the presence of the Holy God, this response of faith to the one who reveals himself as the eternal Holy One from outside of our experience. And this is, this is the encounter with the Holy God that, that John the Apostle has. And it's very significant because if you know anything about the Apostle John, first of all, you know that, that he is described in the scripture as the Apostle whom Jesus loves. That means that, that he has he, has a, he, he knows he's closer to Jesus than any of the rest of the Twelve. He, uh, that closeness, as, as the church has always described it, uh, uh, includes a, a, a perception that, that John had of, of who Christ is that went deeper than, than the rest. That's why in our tradition the Gospel of John has always occupied a sort of higher place than the, than the other three Gospels. Of course, we. We honor all the Gospels, but the Gospel of John is sort of specially singled out. And as you know, as you read the Gospels and you read the Gospel of John, it's written much differently from the other three. It sounds different. It's not put together the same way. Uh, it's rather the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are, that are often called the synoptic Gospels because they, their approach is more of, that, uh, of a synopsis, a summary of everything that Jesus does and teaches. But the... the uh, what John does in his gospel is, is he attempts to, to uh, get into the, the depth of the meaning of everything that has happened through Christ. But this is, this is the John who, who's, whose relationship with Christ is an intimate one, uh, even expressed by, by the, the way the scripture likes to, to remind us that, that uh, he, he leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. So he, so, he has, this, he has this familiarity, yet what happens to him when, when he encounters Christ in his glory? See, when John was an old man, long after the resurrection and, and the descent of the Holy Spirit, toward the end of his life, when he had been exiled, John was the only one of the apostles to not die a martyr's death, but he was exiled to a little island off the uh, Greek coast called Patmos. And there he had the visions that are recorded in the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And this is John's encounter from the first chapter of the book of Revelation. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last uh, letters of the Greek alphabet. The first and the last. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, if you tried to paint a picture of what has been described there, you have a hard time because what, is, what John is trying to describe there is trying to describe in, in, in human description what's basically beyond description. And what's John's response to this vision? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. See, so the one on the one hand who is the beloved disciple who leans on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper, when he sees the glorified Christ 
falls down in adoration before the Holy One. See, that's uh, that kind of, that, that act, that, that uh, Orthodox worship and, and Jewish worship that prefigured it, that act of falling down before, that, that is so essential to, to Orthodox worship. This, by, by that physical act, we, 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 by, we, by doing that, we say, uh, God is all and, and we are dust. God is, God is, is agios. We are, we are very much of this world. And, that, and then we'll see that, that if we do that, you see, if, if we say, I believe in the one God who is holy, and, and we express that faith by that uh, voluntary, as it were, uh, cancellation of ourselves before him, his response to us, because his response to us is to not leave us canceled out. But he calls us to share that, that same life that he has. He calls us, who are creatures of dust, creatures of the past and the future, to share in the life of his, of his divine present. Everything that we believe and profess in the church is how he has made that possible, how he, that was his destiny for the human being, how when the human being ruined, ruined uh, that, that destiny, he did everything possible to restore it. So that's the faith that we express in the words, I believe in one God. Not simply uh, what, what I would call, uh, you know, often in the studies of the spiritual life that we've, we've talked about uh, in other other times here, and this is and this is not the time to, to uh, this is not the place for to go into that in detail. We'll speak more about it later on in the catechumen class. But often the spiritual writers, in fact, I'm not even going to write down anything about it. Uh, talk of talk of having a childish faith and an adolescent faith and a mature faith. A, a childish faith is is kind of can be uh, described as having faith in faith. A lot of uh, unfortunately, what a lot of people, even a lot of, of, of Christians, uh, describe as faith is not faith in God. It, it's faith in faith. It's faith in an idea that they can manipulate around to whatever they want. The kind of faith that, that says, well, if I, if I uh, work myself up into a strong enough expression of belief, or if I do this, or if I say that, if I do it right, uh, God, will, God is bound to respond in the way that I have, uh, that I have determined that he will. See, that's, that's not a relationship with the personal God. That's using God as an object who responds to, to how I pull the puppet strings. Then uh, another, what we could call immature uh, uh, kind of faith is, is the faith that, that insists on trying to understand uh, God with, with uh, the, the limited human mind. Now, we would say that the reason or the logic, which, is among, which are among the greatest of the gifts of God to us, are surely to be used in our relationship with God. In fact, we would say that everything that is taught in the church, n none of it is contrary to reason. None of it is illogical on the one hand. But on the other hand, it transcends. It is, it is, in the end, beyond our, our, our intellectual abilities. And, and what could be called an adolescent kind of faith seeks to uh, always want to dissect God and, and have God uh, conveniently uh, all, all explained and, and prepackaged in little boxes, uh, completely, completely understood. Well, neither one of those is, in the end, adequate, mature faith. Uh, ultimately, faith in God transcends the emotions, transcends the imagination, transcends the reason. When it becomes mature, the emotions and the reason are able to act adequately within a mature faith. But the mature faith, the faith that life in the Orthodox Church makes possible for us calls us into the communion of that revelation that comes from the Holy God to the creation in general and specifically to the, the, the top 
the, the height of that creation that, that he has made, and that is the human person. So, so next time, we'll, we'll speak of God as Father and God as Creator. And with that, we'll, we'll close uh, this talk. And now we'll have our questions. Father David, could you explain again why love is not an attribute of God? The, the question I uh, asked why, why we would not formally speaking, describe love as an attribute of God. The reason why uh, is that love is, is so much part of the core of the existence of God himself that it is, you could say, uh, because, because he himself in the scriptural uh, identification of himself describes himself as love that all of those other all of those other attributes that that we mentioned take place within the context of God being love God is truth in love God is goodness in love God is perfection in love God is beauty in love uh, and whereas those other attributes uh, would not be used uh, synonymously. Beauty, wisdom, truth, goodness, all describe different, different things, so to speak. Love is a more all-inclusive uh, expression of, of the very being of God himself. That's, that's, the, that's the, the way it would be most commonly explained. But, but again, I, it would seem to me that uh, there probably is not an, an exhaustive, rational explanation of that. Rather, uh, the, the identification, uh, almost an absolute identification of God with love that comes, that comes in particularly the spiritual writing of the church, comes from, comes from experience. The, ch the, the people of God, the church, experiences God. As, uh, God and love as being as being one and the same. And could you also explain the other Greek letters around the icon of yes. the Theotokos and Christ? Yes. The question is concerning the uh, letters that are. Oh, I can't move this. They taped it. But I'll do it. Well, I better not. I'll scratch the floor. Um, we mentioned that the words, the the letters above. Uh, the head of Christ uh, identify him as the existing one, as the I am, uh, or on in Greek. And uh, the, the letters that are shown uh, on the two sides of the icon are simply an abbreviation of, of Jesus Christ. Isus, the first, the, the first and last letters of Jesus in, in Greek, and, and Christos, the first and last letters of, of Christ. And then in the icon of, of the Mother of God, same thing. Uh, this is an abbreviation for, for Mother of God, Miter Theou, uh, the first and last letters of those two words. Uh, sometimes sometimes in, uh, among English-speaking Orthodox, some iconographers, though I would say it's, it's not very popular thing, have, have used the English letters there, but I'd say uh, by far it's, it still remains the most common thing to... Uh, and I think, I think it's a good thing that, that we uh, keep some expression, uh, no, matter, no matter who we are, of, of what, our, what our roots are in the church, because, because we are, as I, as I said the other time, uh, you know, there, the Christians do have a history, and either either one's history is, is in the Greek church or, or the Latin church, and, and we are the Greek church as far as the, our, the, our, our linguistic and you could even say, I would, I would use the word cultural, but I'm using that word cultural not simply to refer to ethnic Greek culture, I, but I mean the culture of, of the church that developed in, in the, the uh, Greek-speaking part of the world. So, so these things, these things, little things, uh, keep our, uh, are some expression of our historical roots. Even such things as, uh, you know, uh, Lord have mercy. As a matter of fact, uh, that's kind of, will add a little something to, to the name 
God's name, I am. That name of God, I am, or, or in the Hebrew, uh, Yahweh, which, which was considered in the, in the Old Testament too sacred to pronounce out of reverence. See, they would not pronounce it. They, some of you may be in, in some English-speaking Bibles. A lot of places you'll see the words, the Lord, capitalized. And what they would do uh, is, if they were reading the scriptures, see, they, instead of out loud in the synagogue or in the temple in the Old Testament, uh, or, uh, uh, when they would come to the name of God, instead of pronouncing the, the name of God, they would say the Lord. And, and that word in, for, in Hebrew for the Lord is Adonai, and Adonai is translated uh, in the, in, from the Hebrew into the Greek as Kyrios, Kyrios, and so when Jesus in, in the gospel, especially if you read it in the, in the original, in, in the Greek, Jesus is referred to as Kyrios in the gospel. So when Jesus is called Kyrios, he is being called Adonai, he is being called uh, he who is, uh, uh, the existing one. And, and so that, that uh, oh, such, such a basic prayer of the church, acclamation as uh, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. It's, it's the custom virtually in all parts of the Orthodox world, whether, they're, whether now the people speak Greek or, or Russian or, or one of the other uh, Middle Eastern or Balkan languages or Japanese or, in the, or English in the United States, to at least a, a, on some occasions, as we do here, uh, to, to use the, the original Greek expression there, Kyrie eleison, again, as a, as a kind of, it's one of those linguistic things that's the expression of our historical roots and, and uh, kind of can be an expression of the unity of the church there. Father Basil. Taking off on Tim's question, um, if love is a person, being God, is evil an attribute, or can you say it is a person, too, in Satan? The question is uh, because uh, God is spoken of as, as love personified. That's maybe we can even clarify it a little more. God is love in person. He has within himself the, the, the fullness of goodness, the fullness of truth and beauty, but he, but he, is, love, uh, he is love personified. And the question is, therefore, is there a, a, a similar personification of evil? And clearly, although that's something that we're going to deal with uh, uh, in, in more detail when we come to speaking of the fall and, and the, the, the uh, entrance of, of evil both into the, uh, you know, next time we're going to say how God is the creator of everything visible and invisible, how evil uh, enters into both the, the uh, invisible and visible creation. But we would say, no, there is no such thing as, as evil personified because evil is, evil is the, not, first of all, evil is not the, ab the opposite of love. Evil is the opposite of good, and it is the absence of good. It's, it's the, the absence of what is positive. So, so it has... It has no existence in itself. See, that's the difference. In other words, when we, st when we, when we speak of the devil, this is very important, uh, but uh, when we speak of the devil, the devil is not some kind of opposite of God. You know, that's a, lot of people, a lot of people think that way. You know, they think there's, there's uh, even, even it, it, it uh, oh, sometimes surfaces simplistically in... in uh, you know, well, of course, it's, it's many years now since the, the Star Wars movies, but, uh, you know, you have the good force, the, the dark side of the force, and the light side of the force, and the, the, the dark power and the, and the good power. Uh, uh, it, God and the devil are not the good guy and the bad guy. That's, now, the devil is a very bad guy, but uh, he's not some sort, of, uh, uh, some sort of bad equal of God. The devil is a creature. The devil has a beginning. The devil has limitations. God is the creator, and, and between, as between God and the devil, just as between God and any human being, there is an immense and immeasurable difference because, one, because God is the creator, and the, cre the creatures have a beginning and, and depend on God for their existence. The devil depends on God for his existence. See, but we'll talk about the devil in detail.
Yes, Scott. Sir, I have a question about the role of the Septuagint. Uh, you had spoken about that both uh, here and in your class on Psalms. Right. I took that seriously and uh, got a book about the Septuagint as well as getting a, a Greek-English uh, interlinear of it. My goodness. And uh, I looked up some, some things. The most exciting thing about doing that was finding out uh, the truth of what you said, that uh, that is quoted, you said 100% of the time in the New Testament. Um, uh, just going on the history of some things that you've said that I've wondered about, I have no reason to doubt you at this point. Um, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I have a question because I had looked up in Exodus a key passage about the name of God. Mm -hmm. And um, just to get right to the point, I, the, the question I want to ask is, do the Hebrew scriptures to any degree still have a role uh, uh, it, to, a, to the Christian, uh, to the Orthodox Christian? And by that, you're, you're meaning the scriptures in the Hebrew language? Yes, sir. And the reason I ask is because in looking up this, this holy name, uh, in Exodus 3, 14, he says, I am that I am, and uh, that's translated in the Greek, uh, I, I can't do it exactly, but it's essentially ha'on. Yeah, I am, the, I am he who is. Yes, but in that same passage, God goes on and says, God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The reason why I consider that to be a critical passage is because if, if all else were equal and the Septuagint were, were uh, because of its translation and interpretation by the Holy Spirit, even superior to the Hebrew Scriptures in that sense, this passage would be critical because a name isn't something that bears translation easily. And this being the name above all names, therefore I'm concerned because I am comes across as ho'on, translated from eye, whereas the name of God is consistently translated, and I think rightly so, in the sense of being consistent in the Old and New Testament, um, kurios hotheos, and here, and that name in, in, the, in the Hebrew, uh, you say it's unpronounceable, I only know from my research how to pronounce it to the best of my ability, Yahweh. Yeah. Uh, and that has a meaning in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. The one who causes to be comes from the same verb right. as I am. And I'm wondering, because of that fact, if, if that, I believe that that's the best of, to my knowledge. That's why I say fact. Um, every, <laughs> but uh, is, do the Hebrew scriptures have validity at least to preserve that name? Oh, I, I, would, uh, I would say yes. Uh, certainly in, in the, the tradition within the church of scriptural study uh, from, from the very beginning, you know, the study, the study of the Hebrew language has been encouraged. And, we, you know, we could say that we wish that we had all sorts of things that we don't have. We wish we would have, for example, the, the Hebrew manuscripts from which the Septuagint was translated. We don't have it. We wish we would have uh, uh, he, the, the, the Gospel of, of St. Matthew, either in Hebrew or, or Aramaic, which, which early writings of the church indicate that it was first written in before it was translated into Greek. We don't have it. But, but study even of the, even of the rabbinical text and, and uh, comparison of it with the Septuagint has, al has always been understood uh, as a profitable thing. It's the, the, only, the only point to be made regarding the Septuagint is, is that, uh, for, for the reasons which we, which we enumerated, it is seen uh, as, as having within the life of the church the first place in, in, in the text of the Old Testament. This is not to say that, that the, the, the uh, Hebrew text preserved by the scribes is, is bad or anything, or not, or not profitable. It, it's, it just says that, that the Septuagint has certain uh, expressions that are unique to it, referred, referred to and quoted by the New Testament, that are so central to the life of the church that, that we insist on maintaining that connection.
Yes, Mom. Father David, the, uh, the question I have is regarding faith, and you spoke about there being, in a sense, two, uh, two stages, maybe two steps, one being a, an acknowledgment of the existence of God. And, and I'm wondering if, if this distinction, which I'm familiar with in, uh, in, in Reformed theology of, of an intellectual faith and a saving faith, mm. is, a, is a true and proper distinction, uh, a biblical distinction or a Christian distinction, if you will. And then how do we who are pursuing the true faith uh, rightly uh, approach uh, God with a faith that we, w that we know and can have confidence that, that is genuine? The, uh, the question is, if I, if I, rephrase, if I um, can try to attempt to rephrase it correctly, is that uh, how, how, can we, how do we know that, that our faith is, is in accordance with, with uh, the faith that is described as, as a genuine uh, uh, faith that, that transcends simply the, the uh, intellectual acknowledgement of the existence of God. The, the scripture uh, itself says, uh, I think it's uh, St. Paul, I don't remember what, precisely which epistle this is in, uh, but he speaks of that, that intellectual acknowledgement by saying, uh, you believe, you do well. So do the demons. <laughs> uh, they, they believe in, and tremble. So the acknowledgement of God's existence, although it's a first step, has, has never, never been considered enough. Rather, the faith that, that becomes the response of the person to God within the life of, of the communion of the church is borne out, we would say, by uh, the, uh, the, well, we could use various expressions, the practice of virtue. Uh, that's, that's why, of course, you, you're touching on the, the kind of faith and works uh, controversy, which we'll, we'll, we'll deal with another time, but it's, it's important to, to uh, realize that that controversy never occurred in the it's, it's again one of one of these these troubles that, that Western Christianity has had, uh, especially in the last several hundred years uh, before and since the Reformation. Uh, but we have never seen a, a conflict. We've never experienced a conflict between faith and works. We would say that that it is it is faith which which makes the practice of virtue and the doing of good and the advancement in truth possible. And likewise, it is, it is the practice of virtue and the doing of good works that is the evidence of faith. So the two are, are, are perfectly married to each other. We'd also say, and uh, it's, see, it's so very good that we have these questions because they reveal to me uh, things that, that uh, I have, that I omit, because always, you know, in, in, these, in these sessions, they're never all inclusive. And one of the things that I omitted to say when we were speaking of faith is that it's, it's the experience of the church that uh, faith, true faith, uh, is, is, is a gift from God. It's not the result of human effort, just as the revelation of God of himself to us is not something that we, that we invent. Likewise, faith in that is, we would say, we'll speak of that more w w next time, when we talk about creation and what it means to be created in God's image and likeness. But that means that, there, that, that we would say that there is within the human person uh, that which comes from God and is always seeking God. And in, uh, one of the expressions in the writings of many of the saints, uh, there's variations of something like this, uh, God says, you would not be seeking me unless you had already found me. See, that, that everyone, even we would say those outside the church, even those who are not Christians, who, who in truth are, are seeking God, are, are responding to God working within them. So true faith is a gift from God. It comes, it is given to us, we would say, to the extent that we want it. And to the extent that we want it and it is given to us, it bears the fruit of the practice of virtue and good works. So it's all, all together. Does that, does that address?
Um, just to elaborate more on this faith and faith, it, it's, that's not an exclusion of salvation, is it? In other words, that's a stage. Say a man is 50 years old and still has faith and faith mm -hmm. uh, and, and meets his maker. And uh, I, I guess I'm asking a question that, that only God might be able right. to answer. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of a scary thought. Some of the attributes you explain there, you know, I, I find myself pulling those strings and going, oh, yeah. gosh, oh no, am I going to die? And, did I have faith in faith? You know? Well, you, uh, to, to a certain extent, uh, it's, you know, the teaching of, the, of the, spiritual, the spiritual masters is that as we grow in the, in the spiritual life, uh, it takes a long time to completely shed all, all of the, the vestiges of immaturity. You know, so that, for example, even, even someone well advanced in the spiritual life, it's not to say that there might be one or two little things, you know, little, 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 bits, of, little bits of still baggage that's, that's carried on from earlier stages. And, and what, what we would say to that is, is that wherever, wherever there is purity of heart, uh, the grace of God works. And, and finally, whether it is completed in this life or completed after death, and that, we're not going to talk about that in detail now because we have to later. But, of course, it's, it's the orthodox teaching that, that the spiritual journey does not end at death. It goes on. And, and if, it is, if, if, if the essential things that, that make union with God possible have been accomplished in this life but not fully realized, they will be fully realized as the journey goes on beyond death. But what, what we want to avoid at all costs is, is being, uh, being stuck in, in, in some sort of, in the things of the child. You know, the, the uh, I, I have, and, and it's so frequently the case, you know, that, that you could say uh, people's, people, people's spiritual sense so often remains in a very infantile state. I'll never, I'll, I'll never forget uh, uh, one of the most, uh, on the surface, it, it, it wasn't all that, uh, all that uh, much of an explosive thing, but, but I, one of the most frightening things I think I've encountered as a priest was in my early days as a priest, uh, was in hearing confessions when a, a person who came to confession, uh, this was a, this was a, a uh, uh, here I'm not uh, divulging anything because this is nobody that you would have uh, uh, maybe one chance in 10 billion of ever meeting. But this person, a, a woman in, in her 40s, when she came to make her confession, her voice immediately reverted to the voice of a seven-year-old child. And even her, her, the words that she used were... And, and That's a yeah, classic expression of somebody who never, never developed spiritual beyond that. See? And uh, now, and, and when I say, I, I'm not saying, the, you know, the, again, the, the childlikeness of which has made the kingdom of heaven, but it's this kind of uh, arrested, arrested spiritual development. Oh, yeah. Well, see, God, God uh, the whole history of God's dealing with man is, is God is in his mercy, and it surely is a testimony, oh, and as far as attributes, well, of course, mercy is the expression of God's love, but uh, it, it surely is the case that God accepts uh, people's mixed motives. I mean, even in the great people of the Old Testament, the only person who hasn't had totally unmixed motives is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Everybody else has a certain amount of mixed motives. And in, in somebody, you know, uh, in, in this thief who, who has, who, well, who are we to, to analyze the good thief? but we could say maybe without risking too much error that he has, he has a little bit of purity of heart. See, he, he, sees, he sees who he's crucified with and, and uh, uh, mixed in with who knows everything that he's done in his life. He, you know, we don't even really know that he was a thief. Uh, he's called a malefactor, strictly speaking, in, in the, in the uh, scripture. But the, the church hymns love to speak about how, uh, as, as his at last act of, of, of theft, Jesus allows him to steal paradise. <laughs> that's the testimony of, of, of the mercy of God. You know, that's if you get, if, because nothing is an accident and nothing is the product of blind chance, if you get crucified by the side of Jesus, and, and just, just, there's just enough purity of heart in you to say, 
uh, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom, then, then the, the mercy of God manifests itself by saying yes, and it's yours today. That has elements or, or resonances of Kierkegaard purity of heart is to want one thing instead of to will one thing. Yeah. That's God. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, the purity of heart is found, is found in, the, in the will. It's what we want. What we want. Okay. Let's stand for a little prayer. O oh God, be merciful to us and bless us. Cause the light of your face to shine upon us. Instruct us in your truth. Bring those who are encountering the faith of your church to full communion. Keep us in safety this night. Grant us a peaceful sleep and at the time known to you alone, a blameless death now endeavoring unto ages of ages. Amen.